through some statistics with your data, um, do some t-tests. I have a, um, uh, there's a real easy um, website in there that will do the t-test for you, okay? Once I have your data, I can show you how to do that. Sound good? Um, what else? If you haven't done so already, please read um, Dirt, Skin of the Earth, and that Michael Pollan botany desire. They're on. They're in the, the module for, for botany. All right. Today, We're going to talk about dirt. Yay! Couple of Are you going to post a study guide to the rest of the For um, the exam? Uh, just use the same one. Right? It's already there. We'll we post another one. I, mean, I, can, I can post a one for the second exam, but you can use the same. Was that helpful for people? Yeah. <laughs> you say it wasn't helpful because you didn't use it. That is problematic. Wait. Question. Okay. For our lab practical. I you... go. Somebody's got a question. What's up? For our lab practical, will you yeah. give us like study guides or like stuff that we need to remember okay we're going to go over that so this week we have a field trip next week we're going to wrap up plant parts we're going to have the labs going to be all about plant parts and then the following week is the lab practical so next week in lab i'll be going through all this stuff the lab practical okay, okay. okay so uh remember plants are terrestrial species by and large plants are actually more terrestrial than animals are um Way more industrial. Which means they grow. What does terrestrial mean? What's the root of terrestrial? Terra. What's the second? Earth. Earth is another term that you use for soil. For dirt. So plants live in soil. The technical definition of soil is just the dirt that plants grow. Very functional definition. If it's dirt that can support a plant, it is therefore soil. If it cannot support a plant, it's just Um, there are what are known as the essential elements or, or essential nutrients that are needed for the growth of plants that all plants need in order to grow. You can think about what plants are doing fundamentally is they're taking, well, same thing that we do, but they, they do it differently because they can't eat because most of them can't eat. Anyway, they're taking molecules from the environment and using them to build their bodies, okay? We do the same thing, but we take those molecules mostly from plants and other animals. But plants aren't doing that. Plants are taking them directly from the non-living environment, right? With a little bit of help sometimes. Um, you know, the main elements that plants use are the main elements that all life uses, and those are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But then there are a bunch of others that are also necessary, you know, nitrogen, Phosphorus, potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, iron, on and on and on. Okay? And these are required in varying amounts. Some are um, more abundant, some are less abundant. Some of the trace ones, 
uh, are, are important, but can be sort of uh, hard to find for plants. And again, unlike animals, they can't just walk around and get something if they need it, right? Uh, location is key for where they live. Okay. All right. So the big ones are the macronutrients, as I mentioned. Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We talked about those already. So they get the, the hydrogen and the oxygen from water and the soil, carbon from the air. But these other guys, the nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, sulfur, magnesium, these all come from the soil. Okay. Macronutrients, those are the big ones. If you fertilize your plants, you're probably using a fish fertilizer or something. Um, those are macronutrients you're adding. Then there are the micronutrients, things like iron, for example. Um, and they are essential, but they're only found in trace amounts. Uh, iron, iron actually is relatively abundant on land. In the ocean, it's super limiting. So the uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms, the algae that live in the ocean, are oftentimes limited by iron. It's just not iron. Okay. So. The reality is that natural soil never contains enough nutrients for all the plants to grow. It's just, it's, it's limited. Um, and that's why gardeners spend a lot of time cultivating their soil, uh, quite literally. Uh, both by adding more nutrients to it and trying to get beneficial organisms to live in that soil to create the right conditions for plants to grow. But in nature, Plants, it's always a struggle. They're never getting exactly what they need. Um, very much in the same way that you know, animals also struggle for getting all the nutrients that they need. This is why, anybody like to go hiking and backpacking? Anybody ever go to the Olympics and encounter the goats? They're wild. <laughs> they are. Did they try to like lick you? Uh, they lick the rocks. They lick the rocks. You know what they're doing? They're taking the salt. They're getting the salt, yeah. so. Um, the goats will do this, the deer will do this. Um, when you go hiking in the Olympics, actually anywhere in the summertime, you have to pee. Don't pee on the flowers, you know why? Because the goats will take the flowers. The goats, will, goats and deer will eat the flowers going after your urine. Yeah, you don't leave your backpack out either because the mice and the marmots and deer will eat the straps of your backpack because it's full of salt, right? They're nutrient limited. They're limited in their salts. Um, we don't worry about this in our modern diet. We actually have the exact opposite problem, right? But there's just not enough out there. Um, this is one of the benefits of being a carnivore, by the way. So uh, cougars, bears don't have to worry about this. Do you know why they don't have to worry about it so much? They get it from other animals, exactly. Because herbivores end up concentrating that particularly in their blood, and then when they get eaten by like mountain lion, they're getting that compost concentrated in iron. So yeah. so yeah, so those herbivores obtain concentrated soil nutrients by eating plants, and then carnivores get those by eating plants. Okay. Um, so, you know, why are there problems? Well, in moist, wet soils, which we'll see in a second here, there's, there's the issue of leaching. Leaching is basically the water is doing a constant extraction in the soil. It's just extracting those nutrients out of the soil. And uh, in dry places, water's a problem, right? So it's you never get the exact right conditions, which is why we have things like like it's in greenhouses, right? We try to create the, the proper temperature, climate, and then those uh, nutrient conditions as well. Um, Tropical rainforests, most people don't know this, but the soil in tropical rainforests is incredibly nutrient poor uh, for a couple reasons. One, because it rains a lot, it's leaching the nutrients out of the soil. And two, there's so many uh, microbes and fungi there that they're constantly breaking down any biomass, producing lots of nutrients, which is great, but there's so much plant matter that's just sucking it right out of the soil. So most of the biomass, the living matter in a tropical rainforest is actually in the forest itself. And the soil doesn't have that much. We in the temperate climates of the northern and southern hemisphere, we have a, we have a good amount of nutrients in our soil. And the reason for that is we have a winter time, which 
is when plants are dormant or they die off and they're not able to absorb nutrients. Um, so we get decomp. So you know what's happening now this spring, plants are starting to grow, they're getting bigger, they're producing biomass. They'll do this throughout the summer, come the fall, they go dormant, you know, many of them will drop their leaves, etc. And there'll be all this waste on the ground. That'll get decomposed, that sends nutrients into the soil. But then winter, like you know, real winter happens. Around here we get decomposition, you know, throughout the winter. But a lot of places where it gets very cold, everything just stops, right? What that does that allows nutrients to build up in the soil over a very long period of time, leading to what's called topsoil. We'll learn about that more in a little bit. That real nutrient-rich uh, soil, you know, is really good for us because that allows us for allows agriculture, allows us to grow our food, which is pretty awesome. Okay, all right. So when plants do experience nutrient deficiencies, um, there are certain clues that you can see. Um, if this is for anybody like to garden, any gardeners out there, a little bit. I think you might do it once you actually own your own property or have your own place. Yeah. 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 Um, you can sometimes tell if, if a, you know, so a real simple deficiency in plants that you can see is if they don't have enough water. What do plants look like if they don't have enough water? Wilted. Wilted, right? They kind of like mm -hmm. flopped over, lasted. Um, so, so for example, this is these are tomatoes. Um, this is a, a, a healthy tomato with you know, plenty of nutrients. And then what they do is they basically lose a bunch of stuff. And you can see largely in the color and the form of the leaf, you know, what's happened to them. Nitrogen deficiency, the leaves oftentimes turn yellow. Um, iron deficiency, same thing, a yellowing. Uh, sulfur deficiency. Potassium, this is a problem that we sometimes get around here, particularly with tomatoes, they need a lot of potassium. Um, and calcium. Another problem. I've got a potato bed right now, and it has tons and tons of eggshells in it. This is from our from our house, um, and that's because they just they suck up lots and lots of calcium. Tomatoes are very mm, gluttonous plants. <laughs> they, they love nutrients because they make these. You know, the the fruit as we learned is the ovary, right? And they just produce these massive fruit. They produce a lot of them. That takes a ton of resources and a ton of nutrients. And they're not big plants. They're just annuals. They don't take you know several years to grow. Like we've got an artichoke that's like a freaking dinosaur. This thing's massive, right? It builds up a lot of biomass, and so when it does produce its chokes, it has a lot to support it. Tomatoes, not so much. Consequently, they need lots and lots of nutrients. So you have to like really be good to them. But you get tomatoes. <laughs> okay. So we talked a little bit about soil. How soil works. This is um, like we're kind of moving a little bit into geology here. So if you're wondering why we're learning about this, it's because remember, soil is the dirt that plants can grow in. Okay. So there are um, there are two basic parts to soil. One is the non-living portion that comes from broken down rocks and. Uh, these make up what are called the soil particles. Sand, silt, and clay are the main particles that make up soil. And they're just whatever rock is underneath the soil, the underlying bedrock. It's just those, but they're broken down. And sand, silt, and clay refer to the size classes. I'll get more into that in a second. So but anyway, that's the non-living, inorganic part. And then you have the organic part, which is called humus. And this is the deep decomposed or decomposing uh, organic matter that is in the soil as well. And for, you know, good rich soil, you need both, okay? Now, um, let me see here. So, in my backyard science class, we actually grow stuff and we, we we got, have I shown you guys the Highline's little farm, little micro farm we got, the Highline Garden? It's down there by building 29. It's down there by the, by the south block. Anyway, we're growing stuff down there. And we went in and we did a, we did a, a soil analysis before we planted our stuff. So we, we collected soil, and this is the soil here. Right, this is the soil that we use. And um, Bobby Butler, who runs the um, urban agriculture program here at Highline, has done a lot of work over the years to really develop the soil. 
So anyway, we went down and we, we did some analyses on it. One of the things we did is we looked at, we did a soil composition analysis. And what you do here, this is just a settling chamber, really that's all it is. You get some of the soil and you put it in a jar, add water, a little bit of soap, and that basically just lubricates the particles. Then you let it settle out. And the heavier particles, the sand settles on bottom, and then the silt, and then you wait a couple of days and the clay settles out. And what that allows you to do is it allows you to see the relative composition of the soil. So what's going on is the underlying, the underlying bedrock gets broken down uh, through what we call weathering process. And that can be wind, it can be water, it can be in, in colder places, it can be what's called frost heaving or ice wedging, right? When water freezes, it expands, that causes things to break apart. The roots of plants will also break the rock apart. And over time, that rock gets broken down into these different size categories, right? Sand, silt, and clay. Sometimes you get gra gravel is relatively big pieces, you know, relatively big. Um, but that is creating the soil particles that are going to be the basis of the soil, okay? And that, that whole process is known as weathering, the weathering of rock. They recognize who that is. Now, that's Keith Richards. He's done more drugs than any human being, and he's still alive. <laughs> yeah, okay. He's, he's the guitarist, one of the guitarists for the Rolling Stones. Oh. Oh, that dude. <laughs> Proof that you can live fast, die young, and stick around anyway. So the, the other part of the... <laughs> so, um... The, the other part of the soil is what we call the humus, not hummus, the humus. Okay. And uh, this is the organic portion of the soil. And humus, here is humus. Oops. This is from, oh, there's a little potato bug. Uh, this is from my worm bin at my house. I'll pass this around if you want to take a look at it. And what my wife and I do is we just take the vegetable scraps, you know, plant scraps. Uh, orange peels, banana peels, celery, all stuff. I got, I got eggs in there, eggshells, you can see. Okay. And we let the wormies eat it. We have, a, we have a box in our backyard. We let the worms come through and they chew it up. And that's providing, yeah, see back there, white sausage. No. <laughs> okay. And that's providing the organics um, for the soil. And it's actually an entire ecosystem. So one of the things we're going to do this week in my other class is we, um, we get the critters to come out of there. Uh, and there are all sorts of really cool things like springtails and nematodes and potato bugs and, of course, worms, et cetera, et cetera. And they're living in there. They have an entire ecosystem that they're, they're living in, and they're producing that organic matter for the soil. But I'm going to back up for a second here. Um, you know, and and the soil is you know it's 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 really critically important for the survival of our civilization. That's why I want you guys to do that reading, soil skin of the earth. Um, all civilizations throughout history have required soil, have required good, healthy soil, because it provides the food that we need in order to survive. Uh, you look at places like in the fertile, what's called the Fertile Crescent. Um, Southwestern Asia, North Africa, etc., where civilizations really started. Uh, the reason that they were successful is they had good rich soil. But over thousands of years of cultivation, much of that soil is gone. Um, and with that, those civilizations have crumbled as well. Okay. So, what does it do? Well, it provides us with food and fiber. Okay. Um, things like, well, this stick that I'm using, right? This grew from a tree that grew in soil. Uh, all the paper products that we use that requires soil to grow as well. The cotton that makes our clothing, you know, the wood that makes our homes. We really rely on good soil to grow those plants that we then use. It gets rid of our waste for us. Anybody have a septic tank at their house? No? Do you know what a septic tank is? Paige knows what a septic tank is. 
Yes. Have you ever had problems with a septic tank? No, but I have family. Yes. If you have problems with a septic tank, life sucks. <laughs> it's where your poop goes, right? And uh, for most of us that live in urban areas, it's sent to a sewage treatment facility. For those who live in more rural areas, there's a big tank in your yard. Your poop goes in there. It's underground. And the soil microbes decompose that poop, right? Very important to get rid of your poop. Um, provides habitat for life forms. Uh, it also does something that we really take for granted until it's too late. Uh, it absorbs water when it rains. Uh, we're going to go to Hylobos this week. I'm not going to talk about it much because we're going to focus on, on plants. But places like the Hylobos are really important because the soil there, that natural soil, absorbs rain when we get big rainstorms. Uh, when you don't have places like that, um, when it rains and it just falls on asphalt or uh, roofs, etc., the water has no place to go, and you get urban flooding. Um, actually, there was a young woman about 10 years ago in, in Seattle. Mm -hmm. She lived in a basement apartment and she drowned uh, because of urban flooding. Okay. So again, soil really, really important. <laughs> like that's, that's the take-home message here. Soil is super, super important. Okay. All right. Hello, Keys. Humus. Okay. So we can. So this kind of goes along with how soil is made, how it's classified. So underneath the ground, you have the underlying we call the bed of rock. For those of you who have geology or know a little bit about geology, this rock could be anything. It could be sandstone, it could be granite, all sorts of different types of rock. But that gets broken down and weathered and forms what's called the sea horizon. Right? It's basically just broken down types of rock. Above that is the B horizon, okay? Which is, you know, smaller broken down particles here at the C horizon but also accumulates a lot of minerals that have leached down from the top. Okay. The A horizon is what we refer to as topsoil. The topsoil is that good, rich soil. It's a combination of the soil particles along with the uh, humus from the top layer. And the very top layers we call the O horizon. O standing for organics. That fits actually, it says organic right in that bag there. I just grabbed it out of the, out of the drawer. So this is where the humus is being formed, right here at the top. This is where that decomposition is happening. Okay. So that O layer is made of humus. And if you, if you look inside there, you'll find, like I said, all these cool organisms, grubs, nematodes, uh, springtails, all sorts of cool stuff. And they're doing that process of breaking down the organic matter, which will provide nutrients, things like the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, that's needed for plants to grow. Okay, I mentioned soil texture a little bit before. I want to go back to that in a second. Um, so sand, silt, and clay are the ones we're most commonly interested in. Like I said, gravels, gravel becomes more important when you're talking about sort of large-scale landscaping. We're just talking about growing plants for religion, sand, silt, and clay. Um, they affect how plants can grow in the soil. So. For example, if you have a lot of clay in the soil, clay fits together very well, very compact. That's why we like to use it to make you know, pottery, etc. Um, but that means it's hard for the roots to penetrate. And so if you have a lot of clay in your soil, the roots can oftentimes have a hard time growing. Clay also holds a lot of water. So if there's a lot of clay in the soil, those areas tend to get very wet and it doesn't drain very well. Sandy soils, on the other hand, drain very, very well. The downside is they sometimes drain too well. They don't hold water, one, so you have to keep watering them. And two, they don't hold on to nutrients very well either, whereas clay holds on to nutrients. What you really want is sort of some combination of all three. That combination of all three is what we refer to as um, a loam. So this, have you ever seen a, a, a graph like this? This is a, a three-axis graph. It's kind of cool. Um, so this is putting the percentages of sand, silt, sorry, sand, clay, and silt all on the same graph. Um, and so if you have something that's like mostly clay, a little bit of silt, some sand, that we refer to that as just clay soil. Silt down here, sand down there. In the middle is what we call loam. 
Loam is actually a little bit less clay than the other stuff. So it's about, you know, 50% sand, 75, 80% silt, like 20% clay. And this is the good stuff. Most people, when you're growing your, your vegetables or whatever, you want nice loamy soil. This actually is a relatively loamy soil. Okay. And so it has good drainage, but it also is able to hold on to nutrients and hold on to water as well. It's kind of got a good, good mix there. You guys heard the term loam before? No? Loam? Yeah. Loam. It's, that, it's, a, it's a relatively balanced mixture of sand, silt, clay. It's got a little more silt, about 50% sand, 70% silt, about 30% clay. Okay. And that's like the good stuff that you want your plants growing. If where you live doesn't have loam, and you want to plant a garden, do you know what you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you, you truck in, you truck in dirt from someplace else. Yeah. Burien Park, you guys heard of Burien Park? You ever seen their trucks drive around town? No. Or Carbonitos over on 167, Carbonitos, they're another place. You can just order people, or but my, my wife and I have done it, you order huge truckloads of dirt, <laughs> right? We order topsoil, we order you know, wood chips, whatever you need to add to your soil to, to get that mixture right. Okay. So the primary thing that plants need out of the soil is water. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about how plants get the water out of the soil. Um, remember I said there's a balance in the soil between sand, which drains very well, and clay, which holds on to water. Um, depending on where you live around here, you could have a lot of sand in your soil, you could have a lot of clay. This area had a lot of, you know, there were glaciers in here in parts of the western Washington, and that can leave behind really clay soil, which can be problematic. Okay. All right. So this took me a long time to conceptualize, but there is water in soil. It's in there. Like it's like right now, there is water in this soil. It's kind of crazy. Oops. And what's going on is you have these soil particles, right? Sand grains, clay particles, maybe some organic matter. And between those particles is what we call the pore space, not like pores and I'll have any money as in like the holes, right, the pores. And in that pore space, there is water. Anybody have a well at their house? Anybody ever live someplace where you use well water? Okay. I always thought that what you did when you dug a well is you dug down and you tapped into like a big underground lake. <laughs> but that's not what it is. What it is is you dig down and you get to a point where the, the dirt is filled with water. All of that space between the dirt has water in it. It's totally saturated. Um, and plants have evolved to get the water out of that pore space. They've got these very, very fine little root hairs that grow off their roots. They're single cells, so they're really tiny. And they grow into this root space and absorb water. In addition to water, they absorb all these different nutrients as well which come in the form of ions. We'll talk about the chemistry about how they deal with that in a second. Okay? All right. So, one, how do plants obtain and absorb nutrients? First, they increase surface area by having those little tiny root hairs. Okay? Second, they actually change the chemistry of that water. And third, they have symbiotic relationships with other organisms that allow them some extra help. Okay, uh, let me see here, it's a lot of words. Let's go here. All right. So what happens is the different ions that they need, for example, calcium, potassium, these cations get a, attracted very strongly to um, anions, uh, which can be found on something like this clay particle, for example. As a way of getting those cations released from this clay particle, the plant engages what's called cation, uh, cation exchange. Basically, it's changing the pH of that pore water. And what it does is, through the basic respiration that's occurring in the root, it's releasing carbon dioxide, right? That carbon dioxide becomes carbonic acid, and it 
increases the hydrogen ion concentration of what was reach. In doing so, that helps to mobilize these anions away from the clay particles, making them more available to the group itself. One of the things that we do in our gardens is we change the pH of the, of the soil itself so that it makes it easier for these cations to be available for the root. Okay? Yeah? So is it better for to be more basic? Or you have problems in either direction. So you want to be relatively neutral. Yeah, right around seven. Yeah. You, end up, you end up getting problems either way. So if it's mutualistic, it means that both parties benefit. A plant's getting the water and the nutrients. What do you think the mycorrhizae is getting in return? That's just what lives in the soil. What could the plant provide? Somebody said it. It's in the soil. What's that? What do plants produce? Oxygen, not so big a deal. What's that? Sugar. Sugar. Very good. Yeah. So, so plant gets water and nutrients, nuts, and the fungus gets sugar. Gets food. Okay. Um, some plants have evolved a very interesting relationship with the mycorrhizae. Orchids can only grow with certain mycorrhizae, but in the case of the orchid, the orchid actually parasitizes the mycorrhizae. It goes in and it takes over the mycorrhizae and uses it for itself. So it's not a mutualistic relationship that actually parasitizes the mycorrhizae. One of the benefits of the mycorrhizae is it helps protect against other pathogens. I did a project in college about that, looking at how uh, these mycorrhizae would help inoculate uh, plants against uh, other invaders. You can kind of see here, this is a good example of, so these are uh, Douglas fir trees grown without mycorrhizae and grown with mycorrhizae. Now if you like mushrooms, like mushroom hunting, you'll learn this. There are certain trees and plants that are associated with certain fungi. And uh, for example, if you like, if you like chanterelle mushrooms, they tend to grow around Douglas fir. Uh, matsutake, you know matsutake? You know matsutake? Can you, can you say something? Maybe you want to say anything about matsutake? Maybe I ate that with my noodles. Maybe you ate it with your noodles. 
one Matsutake mushroom in certain years can go for $100. <laughs> <laughs> they're very, very valuable. There's, there's actually, there's an entire mushroom. <laughs> There's a mushroom mafia, you may not know this, but come the fall, yeah, actually, and, it, and there, there are some mushrooms that come out, most come out in the fall, so come out this time of year. Um, but no, there are people who, uh, you know, they go mushroom foraging, and they're very, very protective. They carry guns, etc. cetera, certain, um, like, like organized crime has gotten into the mushroom foraging business, because it's really big money. Masataki's one of the real big ones. Truffles, truffles are really big. Morels are coming out now. Yeah. Why is it expensive? It's so it's one of these things you can't you can't grow it. You have to find it, right? And so supply is limited, um, and it's in really high demand. Matsutake, Matsutake in particular, I guess is used in a lot of or in certain specific um, uh, ceremonies. Particularly in Japan, I guess. I don't know. Does anybody anybody know about that? Yeah. I had a good friend in grad school who was Japanese, and he said growing up when he he went through like a kind of like a coming of age, sort of like a, a bar mitzvah in the Jewish tradition, right? And he got to have a matzah He said that was the only matzah he'd ever seen in his entire life. He's one small story. But Yeah, they they're, they're pretty plentiful around right here. They grow. Uh, they tend to grow near pine trees. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so some different ways in which these nutrients are actually, so I talked about cation exchange being utilized to release uh, the ion to make it more easily available. How do they actually get into the plant? The plant pumps protons across the membrane that creates a gradient, right? Once you have a gradient, it's easy to move down that gradient. Um, they will use either passive transport via um, uh, channels here that will allow things like potassium to move through, um, or they'll use co-transport uh, with um, uh, transmembrane proteins to move things like nitrate across that as well. Okay, so little 211 reintroduction here, um, plants using some you know, basic cellular chemistry to get what they need. You guys have learned about that stuff before, right? Because we're going to talk about a little bit more later on active transport, passive transport, that kind of stuff. Okay. Some of the serious uh, limiting, um, the, one of the big limiting nutrients is nitrogen. It seems to be limited in a lot of places. Um, the funny thing about it is 80% of our atmosphere is made up of nitrogen, but it's N2, diatomic nitrogen, which is almost completely inert. There are a couple ways in which it can become um, biologically available. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, but mostly it's just like you breathe it in, you breathe it out, it doesn't do anything to you. Nitrogen fixation is uh, the process in which that atmospheric nitrogen can become available to plants. Two ways in which this happens naturally one is through bacteria, we'll learn about in a second. Another is lightning. Well, actually, the heat created by lightning is enough to fix nitrogen, but that's not very common. Humans have figured out a way of fixing nitrogen through what's called a Haber reaction, and it's been phenomenally successful. It's doubled the amount of fixed nitrogen on the planet, led to a bunch of problems, but it's also allowed the human population to grow like sevenfold. <laughs> like, yeah, we have seven and a half billion people on this planet right now. Uh, largely because of the ability to fix nitrogen, because we just we can we can produce more food now. Okay, so there's this whole nitrogen cycle thing. There's a lot of words here. I don't like words so much. Okay, so you have the atmospheric nitrogen from the air. There are bacteria in the soil that are able to turn that nitrogen into something that plants can use, in particular ammonium, right? There are also um, bacteria that are able to take decomposing, decaying matter or poop and then turn that into ammonia. Um, there are other bacteria that will take ammonium and turn it into nitrate. Plants can use either. Plants can use ammonium or nitrate. Um, 
If they take in nitrate, they'll convert that into NH4 to be used for growth as well. So there are a couple different pathways going on here. There's the decomposition that's directly from the atmosphere. It's mediated largely by these bacteria. So super, super important to have this bacteria. Okay. All right. Who are these bacteria? The big ones are what are called rhizobia. The third Rhizobia have a special relationship with one specific group. Oh, put it back up for a second. Rhizo again means root, and bio is just living thing. So these are bacteria. These aren't much bio. Okay. And the big thing that they do is they what we call fix. They convert it from inorganic inert nitrogen into ammonium, which can be used by plants. Okay. Um, ammonium for nitrogen. There is one specific group of plants that has this special relationship. Anybody know which group it is? I'll give you a hint. They are the musical fruit. What's the musical fruit? What is it? Beans. Remember? Beans, beans, the musical fruit. The more you eat, the more you <laughs> Two? <laughs> yeah. Beans, aka legumes. Beans have the symbiotic relationship with the rhizobium. So remember that 90% of plants I told you has a symbiotic relationship with mycorrhizae? The other 10%? Those are mostly beans. Yeah. Um, beans are super cool because. Whereas most plants, as they grow, suck nutrients out of the soil, beans actually put nitrogen back into the soil because they have this relationship with the rhizobia. Uh, so a lot of gardeners and farmers in the wintertime will grow beans in their garden plots, not to actually you know, get food out of it, but because it's nitrifying that soil. Here you can see, so this is an experimental field these were grown with the rhizobia, these were not. And you can just see the much healthier plants. Um, what happens is there's a, uh, a, a, a flavonoid that gets excreted from the root hairs um, because uh, of the interaction with the bacteria. And this causes this little nodule to grow and then the rhizobia grow into the root hair, into the plant. It's an infection, basically, and it creates these nodules. But again, it's beneficial to both the plant and to the, um, the bacteria. So other cool adaptations that, that plants have to get nutrients. Um, some plants are carnivorous. This is a pitcher plant. We have, we have pitcher plants around here. The way a pitcher plant works is it has this fluid on the inside and flies will go in there to, you know, get stuff. Um, and they get stuck and they get digested inside of that fluid. Another famous one, of course, is the Venus flytrap, which closes it on, on flies, which is kind of cool. Um, some plants are parasitic, uh, like this daughter um, or this snow plant. Notice they are not green in color because they don't photosynthesize. They actually parasitize other plants. As I mentioned before, orchids as well um, orchids, many orchids are called epiphytes. They grow on other plants. They grow in trees, etc., and they actually parasitize fungi, which is kind of cool. Okay. Question? Yeah. If it's uh, how do you say the word parasitize? Then how is it not a fungi? Uh, it's still a plant. 
I so, thought that's what a fungi was, a parasitized is it? No, not all fungi are parasites. So fungi are their own, you know, monophyletic group of living organisms. Um, so it's a it's a totally different different thing. Fungi are heterotrophic. Um, fungi have chitin in their cell walls. Uh, fungi are saprophytes. Um, you know, plants have cellulose cell walls. They've got plant cells. These have a diff totally different evolution. They're they're totally different group of organisms, but they're parasites. Yeah, they've actually given up the the, the need to photosynthesize. Yeah. Um, so like in all cases where like the plant is like not green and it's yeah. like red, does that mean it's like parasitic in some way? Usually is, yeah. Yeah, typically. Um, I, I, where's the dirt bag? Right here. <laughs> when I first, I should have kept this. When I first, um, oh here it is. So, one of the cool things about having compost is, you know, some of the seeds that end up in compost, they'll germinate. And you guys saw this when it gets germinated, your seeds. But notice that this is mostly white, right? Because it's not photosynthesizing, it's in a bag. Mm -hmm. But it was still growing, right? Yeah. Um, so, it, I mean, eventually it wants to get some sunlight. If it doesn't, it'll die. Mm -hmm. So you can think of those parasitic plants as they just found themselves in situations where they didn't need to photosynthesize. Usually what ends up happening is they're able to invade the roots of other plants and suck the, the sugar right out of those plants. Uh, yeah. So do like the chloroplasts just like become like inactive or something? Or like... That's a good question. I don't know the specific mechanism of that. A good extra credit opportunity. All right, take a 10 minute break. I need your data though. So I'm gonna pull up that spreadsheet on germination data and I want you guys to enter it in the computer, okay? <laughs>